Welcome to Liddypod, Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley. Well, Dave, good morning. Uh, Shall we tell the listeners where we are? Well, we're in our office, aren't we? We are in our office. We often talk about having breakfast, so we thought we'd start this episode of Liddy Pod with breakfast. Uh, you better tell people where exactly we are, Dave. Right, we're in the, the tavern, um, just down a couple hundred yards from the Penny Lane roundabout, and this is, we've got our regular table, regular seats. Uh, we do have a life, but we do like the breakfast here, don't we? They are. Yeah, we are sitting in the Liddy Pod seat at, uh, at the tavern on Smith Down Road. In fact, just by Penny Lane, as you say, literally around the corner from, from Penny Lane. We didn't choose it because it is Penny Lane. We, we chose it because it's convenient to both of us, didn't we, really? Absolutely, it's, it's perfect, and they do superb breakfast, um, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. Hope you don't mind, I'm just... Just a little bit of bacon and toast here. But you always find that uh, it is a bit of a it's a bit of a catalyst for us, isn't it? We sit around the breakfast table and we, we seem to just come up with some ideas, don't we? So uh, before we launch into it, Dave, tell the listeners what this episode is going to be all about. Well, we mentioned at the end of the last one uh, that we're introducing the MBEs, the Mr. Brian Epstein Awards. So we thought, well, we're going to award the first one, which has got to go to the legendary Sir George Martin. So that's who we're going to be talking about today. That sounds great. You, Dave, have recently done an interview, haven't you, about George Martin? Yeah, um, a friend of mine's a great author from America called Ken Womack, um, and he's just published the second volume of doing the whole biography and the whole story of George Martin's life, and it's absolutely fascinating. Dave, we better finish off our breakfast and get on with the show. You're listening to Liddy Pod, Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley. So Dave, breakfast is done and dusted. It was a very fine breakfast, as it always is at the uh, the tavern. Uh, but we're going to talk about Sir George Martin. Yeah, and it's funny enough because when we we said last time about doing the uh, the MBEs, um, a number of people said, "Well, you've got to mention George Martin." Um, and so yes, we've got to talk about, and we've got an interview coming up in a moment. And of course, the big question in Beatles fans is, "Who's the fifth Beatle?" So. Um, when we chat with Ken Womack in a moment, I put that question to him, which he diplomatically answered. But you have to say, without George Martin, what would the Beatles have become? They still would have been great songwriters, but would they have been as good? In the end, what's gonna go down in history are the Beatles and their music, and George Martin was, was such an important part of that. So he's definitely one of the fifth Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Of which there are several others, not many, but but several others. But he, he was, you know, in hindsight, integral because at the end of the day, you know, the, the Beatles are music, and yep. he was integral to what people heard on on record, wasn't he? He was, and if you look at his his career before that, yeah, he's known for the comedy stuff. But there's one little nugget I found. I think it was when I was, I was researching Liddypool all those years ago. It was one of the, the popular songs that. The Quarrymen used to perform was uh, the Liverpool folk song Maggie May. Now, when Maggie May was issued as a single by a group called the Vipers, the record producer was George Martin. Oh, how strange! So actually, at the at the beginning of the Beatles' career, when they were still Quarrymen back in '57, and they're learning these songs, it was George Martin's version of Maggie May that they were listening to. Incredible, incredible coincidence that was. Yeah. yeah. So he, he he pops up all the way through, and it's interesting that. They kept that affection and that respect for him, even after the, the Beatles had split up. Yeah. They still looked up to him, and you know the amount of artists who recorded with him. You know that that's testament to how good he was. It wasn't just that he was lucky in the right place at the right time, as some people think. You know it, he was a genius. Yeah. The Beatles were pushing and pushing, and he was there going with them. Yeah. and enjoying the ride because you know in, in a sense when you look at it you know you had this scenario didn't you where you had a band who had never recorded before yeah. uh, signed to a label that didn't have a track history of rock and roll music no. uh, Parlophone with a producer who had no track record of rock and roll music it's the perfect storm for everything to go wrong really well it is and, and you, you joined together the glue between them is Brian Epstein who's a record retailer with no experience of managing a band or working with a record producer. 
So none of them, in a way, would actually utter the job. And in some ways, I think that's why it worked. Because Brian, and obviously we'll, we'll do a special on Brian in the future. But he didn't know what the rules were to be broken. So he just went with his instinct. George Martin, with his experience in non-rock and roll, non-pop music stuff, he went with his instincts as well. And the Beatles were just, they are almost given full permission by George Martin. What do you want to do? Let's just try it and see what happens. And I think, yeah, that is then the perfect storm. Because if the Beatles had passed the Decker audition, which they fully expected they had done, at the beginning of January 62, they would have been working with Decker and therefore they never would have worked with George Martin. So many ifs and buts along the way. Uh, now, Dave, you caught up with uh, Ken Womack uh, for an interview, which we're gonna which we're gonna play in just a few moments. But just just tell us first of all the background to to Ken Womack, if you would, Dave. Yeah, the, Ken's um, he's a, a scholar, a Beatles scholar, uh, dean at Monmouth University over in uh, New Jersey, um, and I've got to know him over the last few years doing various events, uh, Beatles events with him. Um, a couple of years ago, he brought out the first of two volumes about George Martin's life, um, which is a brilliantly written book. And he's just that now published volume two. So he's done the whole of George Martin's career. So it's not just a Beatles book. You get the whole context of it. And it's really good. And so when he was over in Liverpool recently to do the launch for volume two, I caught up with him um, to have a chat. So at this point, I'll hand over to our special correspondent, David Bedford, somewhere in Liverpool. So I'm here in the centre of Liverpool. In the shadow of Krispy Kreme. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Cozy Club. Yes. How, how sweet is that? I'll say. So, Ken, what the hell are you doing in the middle of Liverpool when you're not from over the side of the pond? Well, first of all, it's always great to come back to the great city uh, and, and, and see good people like you. But I'm also here to talk about volume two of my George Martin biography, Sound Pictures. Firstly, just tell us a little bit about how you picked on George Martin as the guy to write about? Right, well, so it, it came to me after, like you, many years of thinking about the Beatles, and the vantage point I was interested in is what would it have been like to be in that studio, to be the primary, secondary, at worst, tertiary audience when they show up with one classic song after another? What was that like? And I remember vividly, uh, the first time I thought about it was when uh, I was teaching a course on the Beatles and we were talking about the crazy day when they record I'm Down, I've Just Seen a Face and Yesterday, all in the same day, you know, and don't really revisit them again. I mean, obviously, yesterday has been revisited over and over and over and over and over again. But isn't that crazy? You know, what, what kind of life was that? And, and that life was the one that was had by George Martin. So I wanted to know what was it like? must have been glorious and of course what I discovered is often it was glorious but there were times when it was inglorious <laughs> so let's get the awkward question out the way then we'll deal with the easy stuff okay George Martin Brian Epstein fifth Beatle which one um whew. uh you know they they've all said that they're all the fifth Beatle I think at times they were both the fifth Beatle but I, I think we look at this wrong so if the Beatles are a very, very exclusive club that inclu included Brian and George and the four Beatles, and maybe also, not maybe, did include Mal and, and Neil, so now we've got eight. I think at times they were all the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, or eight Beatle. I think they all, it was a shifting calculus. You know, there were times that Ringo was probably the eighth Beatle. There were times when he was the first Beatle. Uh, it was a politics, a movable feast of changing alliances uh, and, and situations that defined that band. So I think it was true for both of them, but not at the same time. Everybody would agree, without Brian, they would never have got out of Liverpool. Not never would have achieved that. And of course, the great thing is that they failed the Decker audition and didn't get to work at Decker, but they got to work with George Martin. How much of a difference did that make the Beatles working with George Martin? Well, it makes all the difference. Um, I like to describe it as the Beatles go sideways toward this entire industry that's set in its ways, that has certain cultural expectations and, and regional prejudices and the whole business. Um, it took a band led by a fake manager, <laughs> a man who wasn't really a personnel manager, who just saw a spark and decided to go for it. Um, 
who had failed at almost everything he'd done, by the way, except running a record store, uh, who went at the business sideways with four guys, well, five, right? Because eventually Ringo was, well, or could be more even. Uh, but that's for another podcast. Uh, there could be like 14 or 28 or what's the final number? Well, I got five, 104. So yes, there you go. go. So, so I'm the 105th Beatle. Yeah, that's right. That I thought so. Uh, I'm 106. <laughs> so in any event, um, you know, they, they go at the business sideways because they're really not what the business thinks it's looking for. And George is the last piece. He's the piece... Uh, maybe even after Ringo, because I don't think George really has decided he loves them in quite the same way until after Ringo's in the band. Yeah, good point. I think one of the things that came out um, from the first volume was that maybe Brian and George Martin had something in common of where they were socially. I hadn't fully understood George Martin's sort of working class background because you always hear this beautiful voice and stuff, but that's not where he came from, was it? No, no, he was... Uh, working class um, when his parents worked which was not always yeah. um, they you know he grew up in the depression it could not have been rougher the unemployment was rampant his father for much of his early life did not work um, it's not that he wasn't trying there was just no work to be had um, and he was a master carpenter so he's more of an artist than simply a, you know a kind of day laborer so it was tough for him to get work especially the kind he was about which he was passionate um, but yeah, Brian and George uh, have a fascinating relationship because, um, and, and Brian would, in his flowery way, describe it as an instant friendship. <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't. Um, life isn't really like that. But what they had together, when they decided in November 1962 that they were going to do this thing, um, when they decided they were going to do this thing, together they really showed their ambition cards. And that's when they started to say, okay, we're going to have, we're going to make an album. <laughs> that's crazy. Then they do that, and it works. And you get to the Palladium, and then later the Sullivan Show. Now we're going to have two albums a year, four singles or three singles, and, and a film. Yeah. You know, so they, they are doing everything they can to consolidate fame and success, not just for these guys, but for themselves. Absolutely. But what was interesting about that relationship is how they each viewed it. And, you know, Brian thought, and maybe he's being flowery again. He, he loved to build a myth, and he never gets to turn 33 and tell us how maybe the story really went. Um, but he loved the idea that George was a hit maker. You know, and George would say, no, I'm not. I am a hit maker with these guys, yeah. the Beatles, and I can be a hit maker because of the British invasion with these guys. But, of course, there was an expiration date on that. It was only so much... You know, Jerry and the Pacemakers that the world wanted, or, or you know, Billy J. Kramer, etc. Uh, the foremost, especially, right? Yeah. Um, so, George had, I think, a better read of what his real talents were, whereas Brian thought they could never do wrong, and, 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 and Brian believed the myth that he was creating. Yeah. I think one of the interesting things, again, that's come through uh, both volumes, is George Martin's role in the studio because he wasn't the engineer, he wasn't the guy turning the knobs and mixing the, the songs together. That wasn't his role, was it? He was. He liked to get down with the songwriters and in the song. Yeah, he would, in later years, once George had a different vocabulary and he'd run studios for a long time, by, by the time he was doing these kinds of interviews, he would say, and he was right, that his best thing was head arrangement, right? He could help you come in and routine a new song to use the old parlance, <laughs> and he, he could hear it, and he would say, start with the chorus. Um, that middle eight's terrible. Don't even have that. You need a solo because this song needs some life to it. He was very, uh, we need to, once the Beatles trusted him enough, you know, we need some strings. We need some flutes on You've Got to Hide Your Love Away. Yeah. Right? We need to give this, uh, this song needs some color, and it doesn't currently have it. So he was very good at head arrangement, and you can see that. When he works with America, you know, decades later, he's working with them and he's yeah. giving them great head arrangements. Yeah. Or he's give, <laughs> he's providing great arrangements for, for Jeff Beck, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So Put the orchestration first. Don't hide it. Yeah. You know, all sorts of things like that. Um, you can listen to something and, and listen to the magic he brings to that song. He elevates it. Yeah. And, and they wouldn't achieve what they achieve without George Martin there in the mix. Um, but I think the interesting we all need a George Martin. <laughs> we all need a George Martin, don't we? 
This is Liddypod, Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley. So Dave, some fascinating information there with uh, Ken Womack. What, what really stuck out for you in, in, in that part of the interview? I, d- I love the, the way, almost like we were alluding to at the beginning, how the relationship forms. And at, at first, George Martin wasn't sure of them. He wasn't particularly impressed with their music, but it was their personalities, particularly John Paul and George, that leapt out to him. It was that goonish sense of humour and of course George Martin having worked with the goons um, there was something there in their personalities that he saw not so much the music and I, I love the fact that he was able to almost reflect their personalities in the music and as they got more and more technically creative they were still working on such limited um, like four tracks and stuff it had to be so so precise and now that sort of the repolishing all the early recordings, it shows how good the initial stuff was. Um, but I, the bit that interested me was that um, where Ken was saying that, that George Martin wasn't a hands-on technical guy. He wasn't twiddling the knobs. He was down there in the studio. Um, so now, like he finishes that one in 66, at the time when, crucially, the Beatles stopped touring. So then, now thinking, what's the future? It's not as a touring band playing live they're now going to be living in the studio and i'm guessing and we'll find out in a few moments for your second part of the interview that's when the real creativity started to flow oh it does and i love the fact that ken's called the second volume sound pictures because that's how george martin described what he was trying to do he was trying to paint pictures with sound and in a way i think because his mind was so open to anything you know, at that point, the Beatles, they're buying their own machines. They're recording at home, bringing stuff in. And he says, OK, let's try it. And the equipment still wasn't advanced like it is now, but the stuff they were able to do was amazing. So, yeah, here's a bit more from Ken and about uh, George Martin and his sound pictures, which takes you all the way up um, to George's death. And where the, the second book starts is at a very interesting time in George Martin's life from a business point of view as well as where the the Beatles are changing as well because George Martin he's really just salaried at EMI he's he's not probably earning what he should be doing for the work he's doing right and he didn't like that no he didn't like that at all he's making three thousand pounds in 19 uh, his last contract which he was renegotiating when he said forget it I'm going into business for myself Um, he needed to (laughs) as we know he had two households he was he was running um, and, and paying for, but what an incredible amount of risk he took. You know, we, his flaws are interesting just like all of our flaws are interesting when you study anybody's character. But uh, when you look close, the, the level of risk he took, he risked not being able to continue to work with the Beatles. Yeah. I mean, that was on the table. Um, they, of course, could have chosen not to work with him. I like to believe, and I think uh, when we see Tune In Volume 2, I think we'll probably learn that he had made sure uh, that some of those I's were dotted and, and T's were crossed, that he, 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 he knew he was going into a level of risk, but he probably found a way to hedge his bets. Um, but it was a, an incredible moment for him. I mean, he took a lot of risk. The Beatles were at a crossroads. You know, what are they going to do? They know they don't want to tour much longer. When, when Book 2 starts, they have toured England already for the last time. Yep. And of course, they, they've toured America for the last time. And I think George um, Harrison famously said, that's it, I'm not a Beatle anymore. Yeah, because of course, back then, you couldn't imagine how, how are you going to have a career if you're not a working rock and roll band? That's all anybody knew. Absolutely. And they didn't know it that long. No. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, that was still a relatively new model. And George going independent, you know, there were a lot of independent studios and producers, but they started usually as independent. They didn't quit and leave the mother teach right no. of the right I'm, i don't mean Absolutely. to be indelicate but they didn't leave no. the job that you know george, george wasn't going to lose that job no um, he I, wasn't going to get a raise no, no. <laughs> but he wasn't going to lose that job no again when you think of time scales you're thinking they're recording the first album early 63 in 24 hours fast forward four years and sergeant pepper comes out the length they've gone to in that short period of time 
do you think George Martin enjoyed having that extra time to spend in the studio, to spend with them? Absolutely, but he liked it for two reasons. Okay, reason one is the good reason. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe reason two is good too, but re reason one is, yeah, I mean, he was an artist from his earliest days, even when he didn't know what the hell he was doing when he was turning the knobs in 1951 or so, right? And and, and Oscar Preuss let him loose <laughs> uh, as assistant A&R guy. He, he saw the, the studio as a place where you could create imagistic kinds of sound pictures, right? That, that's his friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, to be able to have the space and time to do what they wanted with Sgt. Pepper, even with the White Album, was was amazing for them. And I don't know that they ever thought they would have that kind of, of uh, the word I'm going to use is power, yeah. <laughs> but they did, and they knew what to do with it. Great artists know what to do intentionally when they have something and it's living in that moment and doing something with it to me that's what brilliance is brilliance yeah. isn't a great iq score or you know being this kind of you know closet genius brilliance is saying i'm going to do this right now because this is important and i've got the skills but i want to come back to power because that's yeah. the other reason george loved that they were able to accrue that level of power yeah to be able to be in the studio you know, he, he loved that. Yeah. Um, and, it, of course, most of it was made possible by the fact that they were, A, the Beatles, but, B, EMI owned the space. <laughs> yeah. They weren't paying rent. You know, they were going to be open anyway, and you might as well be open for the, play, the people who have probably by that point created hundreds of millions of pounds for the va of the value for the company. Yeah, absolutely. So then you go from Sgt. Pepper, and, of course, this year everybody's celebrating the White Album. Now, that is like... Not quite a completely different band, but the sound is so different. They've gone from something which seems coordinated to this double album of just about every kind of musical genre you could have. Do you think that's what they needed to do? It's almost like if Sgt. Pepper's your first one, White, the White Album is your difficult second album. Yes, in a way, and, and, and I think they needed to jettison psychedelia. Yeah. Um, you can feel at the edges of the magical mystery to a project it's just running long in the tooth there are great moments we all know it. yeah i mean i i love blue jay way i love i'm the walrus that's a classic that's brilliant but let's face it they could have gone they were threading the needle there there wasn't much further they could have gone and the movie actually demonstrates to us yeah why too much is is actually enough um and it was becoming excess and indulgent they would say, you know, every time we do a new album, we want to do a new sound. Well, okay, that's what they did with the White Album. There was space for George Martin, but nobody was the same on that record, and he wasn't either. You know, it was a, a contentious political space. Yeah. Um, we know Jeff Emmerich quits. Uh, Ken Townsend was reminding me recently, though, that he, you know, God rest his soul, we have to say, poor Jeff. But um, Ken said, you know, Jeff liked to say that he didn't like the tone and the and, and the way people were behaving, and he didn't like to see people, um, you know, picnicking on each other and being awful to each other. And he'd seen George Martin actually raise his voice a few times. Ken said, if we really read that correctly, though, he also was not happy that he wasn't getting respected. Yeah. And that's a theme, right? So Jeff didn't feel respected. We know George didn't toward the end of that record, uh, George Martin. We know that George Harrison doesn't feel respected with... Uh, with Let It Be, with, excuse me, Get Back, and he says, see around the clubs, and gets the hell out of there. Yeah. Um, Ringo doesn't feel respected. Walks um, out. Yeah, walks out. Um, so it's a common theme, uh, but it was a, certainly a different and very contentious political space. Yeah. Do you think anything uh, with the aftermath of Brian dying, do you think that affected how they approached the White Album? Were they approaching it as the Beatles in a different way? Was George Martin any different with them? after Brian was no longer with them. Well, you know, I keep coming back to May 1968, going to New York City and saying, we're doing Apple. Yes. <laughs> um, I, it, it's hard to think about this, and, and maybe maybe this is the book we both need to write next, right? But um, it, would Brian have countenanced that in quite that way? Would he have had enough power to say, don't do this, right? Or do this differently? I like to think he would have in the sense that he always had the best accountants, you know, the best that London could offer. He he figured out early on what he didn't have. He needed to go get. Yeah. He needed to outsource it. So would it have gone in the same way? I, I like to think not. Um, 
but but Brian left a gulf. He may not have done anything in particular, but he was part of again where we started just a few moments ago. He was one of the the gang of eight, we'll call them. Yeah. He was one of those central people. Yeah. And uh, there was a gulf that was left, and most of these folks, with the exception of George, are young guys. Yeah. And you know. It was suddenly there was a, a, a political a politi- political space that nobody knew what to do with. Yeah. And of course that. And they loved him too, which. Well, of, of course, of course, that makes a massive difference. Then of course you see you get the the Let It Be project, which is just disorganized chaos. Sure, and 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 Martin, I believe, made several miscalculations. He was not around when they got the idea for it. He was on vacation. Um, he had been very good up until then of knowing what was going on and knowing where the chess pieces were. He allowed several pieces to get played while he was gone with Michael Lindsay Hogg. Yep. So, you know, fast forward only a few months and they're kind of going on without him. And, uh, and they had, and it was, I think to a certain extent, Paul McCartney is the one who approached Glenn Johns. Um, and a myth had developed over the years, and God knows I'm one of the people who spouted it at times, that Glenn was there because he had the union card, right? <laughs> yeah. And that wasn't true. Glenn was there because Paul said, we want you to make the next album. And so he did. Yeah. Um, now, Glenn, uh, and I say this having never met him, but I do believe he was naive and trying to please them. He was a younger guy yeah. trying to please these, the most famous band in the world, the most powerful band in the world, and... That, that crazy 1969 is such a weird comedy of errors, right? When he keeps coming back with a different version. After a while, George Martin is helping him. Yeah. And they're trying to meet the specifications of this crude, primitive album, you know. Remember, at one point, the Get Back album had songs that just collapsed. They picked, like, the fourth best take. Yeah. And then, of course, every time Lennon and McCartney would hear it, they'd be like, yeah, that's not quite it. <laughs> yeah. Because even though they were talking a big game about, we don't want the jiggery-pokery of production... Good God! Look at the out. Their their track record says something else. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and it, it goes to show where George Martin is least involved is when there's the most recording chaos. Sure. And I don't think that's a coincidence when you look at their relationship and how they work together. And of course they say, Abbey Road, George. Yeah, he comes doing back anything. In. Right, and they and they do uh, allow him the right space. Um, now. I don't know this. I was not able to interview him about this question, and I, I don't know that we'll ever have a satisfactory answer. Uh, but, but the, the, to me, the, you know, the, the question that will always be out there is, um, <laughs> you know, to what level did George really have this kind of level of control that he had said, are we going to make the album like we used to? Yeah. Or was some of that this kind of um, ex post facto storyline? I, I don't know that we'll know that. Um, I think we can listen, and we, we have, to some of the outtakes, and you can hear them having a very good time. <laughs> yes. And the results certainly speak for themselves. Fantastic album. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, yeah, without question. But there, there are always going to be certain spaces where we have to let the results speak for themselves because some of the biographical nuances are going to be tough to pull out and have been and maybe always were. Yeah. I'm <laughs> talking before, and you, you mentioned about the way they finished the album. It's almost the, the drop the microphone bit, which is like the thing to do now, isn't it? It's their crowning glory. And it's like, here's the end. And, the, and they're quitting at the top. That's right. And, and you know what? They don't become the cliche. That's what they fought off and successfully not done. You know, every great TV show that goes into mothballs or, you know, or, or rock band or author or whatever who calls it quit but then comes back... You know, I can't come up with an example where I'm not like, oh my God. That works. Why? Why did you do that? You left. You had hit the note. Yeah. You know, and of course, it's it's our fault as the audience. We're the ones who are nostalgic to bring the thing back. Uh, yeah. The American TV show Murphy Brown just came back on the air. Really? Okay. Now, I have to admit, I wasn't entranced by it the first time, but just leave it in that space. Yeah. Right? Let it stay in that space. I was always great, grateful they never got back together. Yeah. I, I could never envisage it. Well, I, I do believe it was coming. I think yeah. it was coming in 1981. Yeah. Um, you know, John is on tape saying things in that studio yeah. in August and September. Yeah. 
and, uh, and you know, and Paul is playing right to it. He sent him the flowers on his birthday. They had lots of nice phone calls. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, it breaks my heart every day that John Lennon is dead. I think, I, I'm sure you feel the same way. Absolutely. That, that is a marker in our culture and in our lives. Yeah. You know, it is a it is a blank evil space. Everything changed. But having say, said that, if somehow he lives, I can't imagine the Beatles as an 80 band, 80s band. No. The 80s did awful things to many, um, many acts. You can hear it coming on with one of my favorite bands, Led Zeppelin. Yeah. That last record, and it's a great record. I love In Through the Outdoor, but there's some synth stuff there. They're going, they're spiraling. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 Queen. <laughs> You know, uh, I don't, uh, the Rolling Stones, you know, I was listening to Emotional Rescue the other day. What a no. weird, misbegotten <laughs> album. You know, they survived the disco-ness of some girls to make that. Yeah. You know, so I guess my point is, I don't know that, I think what they did lived in a very distinct space. It yeah. would not have been the same band. Definitely. You know, just, just like a couple that breaks up. I guess this is what, Richard Burton and uh, <laughs> Elizabeth, Elizabeth Taylor. Taylor. Um, <laughs> But a couple that breaks up and gets back together is not having the same relationship. No. And if they think they are, they are deluding themselves. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the Beatles have finished. George Martin was independent. Of course, he carries on working with a number of well-known artists. He's never going to top working with the Beatles. Obviously. And he never does. And he, and he never does, sadly. Now, do you think that as he was growing with the Beatles through the 60s, do you think that was only because he was collaborating with them? Did you see him progress after the Beatles in his job as a producer? He does, to my mind, um, and this may not be the popular view, but uh, I see the solo Beatles um, at their the height of their powers into 74, 75. Um, and from then on, there are great moments, yep. especially in, in Lennon's career. He has some triumphs there at the end. McCartney has several returns to greatness. Um, greatness with an asterisk. Yeah. Right? I mean, but closest to the moment of disbandment, disbandment, they do their best work. Yeah. And George Martin's the same way. But you've got Paul with the McCartney album. Maybe I'm Amazed is a Beatles song. Imagine is essentially a Beatles song. Yeah. God is a Beatles song about the disbandment of the Beatles. Yeah. You know, yes. <laughs> the, the, the George Harrison album is the album he would have made with the Beatles. Yeah. Um, you know, that all things must pass. Ringo's album is with the Beatles, Ringo, <laughs> yeah. in 19, 1973. So, you know, so you have this uh, this incredible nexus, and George is the same way. Um, not all of the uh, the albums that he does uh, at that point are world-breaking, but many of them are very, very good. Um, Stack Ridge is a great record. Uh, Jeff Beck, the great uh, Diamond Dust, great album. It's a beautiful record, yeah. um, and, and he's making a, just doing a lot of exemplary work. His work would live and let die. Absolutely, he elevates that song. Yeah, you know, um, he was right back in the saddle, and he elevates the band America. You know, they they had an album where they came out of the gate with a different producer, and they were killing it, and then they just tanked. Yeah, and they brought George in, and he writes that ship. He was so worked so hard for them that he went back and reproduced and remix their earlier stuff to put out their famous uh, greatest hits album which of course re-cemented them yeah. as a working band so yeah. you know they they all have their great moments but it's what happens when the parts that came together so beautifully are dispersed it's not quite the same again no not that you should bring the band back together like yeah, you said abso earlier absolutely so if you had to sum up george martin from all these years of research that you've done and your, your two books how would you sum him up to somebody who'd never heard of him? Um, I would I would talk about head arrangement and and the great skill he had. He was really a arranger was his best skill, even better than orchestration, yeah. uh, and certainly better than production. He was a great arranger, and you know you can turn on the radio right now and you hear songs that if you're discerning at all you'll say, well that's not a very good arrangement. You may not know how to fix it. Yeah. George Martin knew how to fix it. And he really knew how to fix it when it had names like Lennon McCartney, Harrison Starr on it, right? Um, but I end with a very important word in volume two. The last word is friend. Because <clears throat> when George decides in November 1962 he's going to do this thing, he never looks back. Yeah. Even in the dark times, he doesn't look back. And when he comes and he works on some of their, their compilations in the 70s, 
thankless, not paid very much, sometimes not at all. He comes back and helps with the CD releases in 1987. Um, he starts to get treated properly with the anthology project. And I hope, uh, I don't know the figures exactly, I hope it was he was paid handsomely because he deserved he it. He deserves it. But he never stopped being a friend of theirs, even when they weren't his friend, even when they may have said things to diminish him in the press. And at certain points, the two people he valued the most did do it more than once, but he never, ever stopped being a friend of their project, even after they're half dead. Yeah. And he's in his dotage and he's suffering from cancer at the end of his life. You know, he thought long and hard about the Love Project. Yeah. His son had to win his trust on that and, and play him and show him how that could be done. He was always their friend. He was a good guy. So give us, a, again, the title of your book and where people can get it from. Uh, sound pictures and discerning bookstores everywhere um, and online retailers. You're listening to Liddy Pod, Beatles banter with Bedford and Beasley. So that was Dave, uh, you speaking to Ken Womack there over two parts of an interview. Fascinating interview and a great opportunity to be able to interview him here, here in in, uh, in Liverpool. Uh, but we did say a couple of Liddy Pods ago, we are introducing the MBEs, the Mr. Brian Epstein Awards. And today, our first one is going to Sir George Martin. And Dave, you would say, deservedly so. Absolutely, absolutely. Without George Martin, they never would have created the sounds that they did. Um, he was an absolute genius. Um, and you can't really separate him from the Fab Four when you're talking about the music. Obviously, we've got Brian for getting them, getting them there and being their manager and his vision, phenomenal. When you look at the music, George Martin is right there in the mix with them. So, yeah, definitely. He deserves the first MBE from Liddy Pod. Do you think, uh, do you think Dave George Martin enjoyed this new direction? Because as you were saying right at the start of, uh, of this Liddy Pod edition, uh, his background wasn't rock and roll music, you know. And, and do you think he really enjoyed the, that sort of diversion away from what he was used to doing? I think he loved it. And if you look at the other artists he'd worked with, it's such a great variety. You know, you look at a band like America, you know, he got them in the studio and produced probably their best album. You know, he loved picking people and saying, okay, I can see the potential, but we can do. And I think that's what kept him going. It was the challenge to do something new. And that's what he loved about working with the Beatles. As we know, every album was different. They were pushing the boundaries. They were trying to do something new. And he loved that. And I think the fact that he wasn't tied to a recording desk and knob twiddling, he was right down there in the studio with him. That's what he loved. He loved that dynamic and he just loved the challenge. And the other thing for me, Dave, is, I mean, obviously the, the equipment they were using at the time was cutting edge equipment of that time. Today, you know, the whole thing has moved on a, a, a several light years, hasn't it, really, in terms of digital recording and effects and everything else. Do you actually think that, and I'll put this to you now, if, if that whole scenario was happening either today or then with the facilities they have today, do you think that actually in a way might have stifled the creativity because things were so much easier to do today? That's a very, very good question. And there's probably one I could ramble on about an hour with this because I'd love getting into this bit. Because in some ways you can have a studio now on your laptop, which you can take out with you, keep at home. It's got samples, it's got loops, it's got synthesized bits you can all throw together and you can do that in your bedroom. And yes, that is nice to be able to do, but, and this is me, the old fuddy-duddy here, you still, for me, cannot beat a band with instruments. And that's what they did. It wasn't a synthesized sound. It wasn't press a button and we get something that sounds like. Because you can now buy, and um, they've done these computer programs, and you can make a keyboard sound like any instrument that the Beatles used on a particular song, on a particular album. Like you can get the exact sound recreated yeah so <laughs> don't get me going on this one you know, which is great and it's fun if you want to try and recreate that but what they were doing was cutting edge they didn't have all the most advanced equipment at the time other studios had better than they did they were playing catch up quite a bit at the time uh, at EMI but I love that image they talk about trying to create these loops and of having the bits of tape with engineers with a pencil 
dragging the tape out, going around the whole studio, sometimes into other studios, just to get this tape loop to make this sound. That you cannot recreate by pressing a button on a computer. And I think that is why back then it was more difficult than it is today. And yeah, I think because they were pushing the boundaries, that made it more exciting. And yeah, it would have been easy yet they made today had tried to do all that stuff. I still think they would have wanted to do it the way they did. Subscribe at liddypod.com and you'll never miss another episode. Now, Dave, a feature that we've been talking about for a couple of weeks off air, and we haven't really mentioned this in, uh, in Liddypod, is one of the, 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 the things we always get around to talking about, one of the, the great things I love about meeting with you, whether it's over coffee, over our famous breakfast, breakfast. now, or whatever, is how you are able to forensically analyse certain aspects of the, the Beatles story. And uh, I... I, I decided to call you the Beatles detective yeah, you did. because you, you, you are a forensic analysis when uh, uh, analysis when it comes to things like this so David Bedford Beatles detective we've been talking today about Sir George Martin what is it you're going to pick apart and analyze for us today right well um, elementary my dear Beasley um, <laughs> thank you for that title um, I've actually start, I've started a blog called The Beatles Detective. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, how can at, they find that? At thebeatlesdetective.com. At thebeatlesdetective.com. Even Great. I can remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to start sharing different um, things that I've looked into over the years. Um, the one I wanted to pick, because we've been talking about George Martin, was one that I dug into with doing uh, Finding the Fourth Beatle, uh, most recent book. And it was uh, the big question of, in June 1962, were the Beatles under contract to Parlophone, or was it just an audition? Now, for years and years, we've been told that it was an audition, uh, which is fair enough, and that sounded sounded fine. But then when Mark Lewison uh, brought out his incredible book, Tune In, um, he made a statement and said, the crucial documents are clear beyond doubt and can dispel any misleading information for whatever reason it existed. This was no audition at all. The Beatles were at EMI because they already had a contract. Okay. Now that is a game changer. That that was a big, big thing. And so the way uh, my friend Gary Popper and I, when we were doing the book, even though total respect for Mark, he's still our historian. We challenged everything. Um, and that's how I, I consider all these things. Look at an event, challenge it, look at the evidence and get digging into it because if they were under contract, it makes that session completely different to if they weren't, which I'll explain in a moment. Now, the evidence he put forward was um, there's um, a red form which EMI completed, and that gets filled in if there's a recording session. So on the face of it, that would make you think, yeah, they're under contract. So you can see where that's from. Now, in my uh, previous life as a, an insurance person, I did exams in English law and contract law. Uh, and Gary Popper, he's, he's worked in contract laws and various other contracts over the years. So the two of us have got quite a good background. But we thought, as this is so important, let's go and get some um, objective evidence. So I spoke to um, a guy called Peter Bounds, a retired solicitor, a former chief executive of Liverpool City Council. Oh, nonetheless. Exactly. So he will have come up against um, a thing or two over the years. <laughs> and I thought, so here's a guy. He's objective. And I went to with, with all the evidence. And I said to him, I remember from doing contract law, you need um, offer and acceptance and consideration. And that is, somebody offers you a contract, you accept it. On the basis of that, we exchange money and services, whatever it is. The one thing I forgot was the extra, and it's the important element to this one was, when setting out to do whatever you agreed, was there an intention for both parties to be under contract to create a legal relationship? If they were, then that confirms it. If they weren't, then the contract isn't in force. So I then went digging, and this is where I love it when you say forensic, I call it nerdy. Um, <laughs> but I, I just get so stuck into these things. So I went digging for every bit of evidence I could find from any quotes from 
George Martin from Brian Epstein, from the Beatles, from the engineers, anybody, everybody who was there, what did they say? The key one for me to start with was George Martin. So when it was put to him, um, and it might be Mark actually put it to him and said, um, why did you have them under contract at that time? And George Martin said, I wouldn't have done, it's preposterous. So it's clear in George Martin's mind, he didn't consider them to be under contract. Then went and found the quotes from Brian Epstein, who also said, George Martin was impressed, but we haven't got a signed contract yet. The other Beatles all saying, they still didn't know if they had a contract, and they were all waiting. So all the evidence starts saying, nobody on either side thought they were under contract. That is then backed up. Um, I actually went back to um, one of Mark's previous books, The Beatles Chronicles, a uh, fantastic book. And in there, he's got all the paperwork within EMI that shows where the contract was up to. So a draft contract had been sent out for Brian to consider. He signed it, but it wasn't signed at EMI until the 18th of June. Okay. Right. So it was then signed and sent back to George Martin to pass on to Brian. So it's clear from all of that, nobody on either side thought they were under a signed contract on the 6th of June. So what was the status of the 6th of June? It was an audition. It was an audition. It was an audition. George Martin had sent a draft contract to Brian to say, if we go ahead, this is what the terms will be. Um, now, all this is um, in Finding the Fourth Beetle, and it, it takes up six and a half thousand words, which I'm not going <laughs> to tell you the whole thing. Um, but when you get into the wordings of the contract, if they had signed it beforehand, it was so restrictive that they couldn't have done anything else elsewhere. So there's no way they would agree to it. It also puts the onus on EMI. Why would they sign a band they'd never seen? Well, they, as George Martin said, it's preposterous. They wouldn't have done. So it was an audition, um, sometimes called a recording test. What George Martin had said to Brian was, bring the Beatles down. Let me look at them under studio conditions and I'll consider it. So basically, AMI had prepared the contract, sent the contract to Brian Epstein. He'd signed the contract, yeah. sent it back to uh, to EMI, yeah. but they deliberately had not signed it because they hadn't yet auditioned the, the group. Exactly, and it was it was down to George Martin to offer them the contract or not, and he deliberated on it. And the audition was sixth of June. He didn't send it over to be signed until a week or two later. It was only at that point that he was convinced, not musically, because the audition wasn't great. But he thought, they've got something about them that I want to work with. Now, it wasn't going to cost EMI a lot of money anyway. It wasn't a massive risk to take, but you don't just hand contracts out to anybody. And so, at that point, once EMI have signed it on the 18th of June, that's a fully signed contract. Now, interestingly enough, that contract wasn't sent to Brian until the end of July. The, the signed contract, the signed contract. from the AMI end yeah. was not sent back. Yeah, so even George Martin had it um, before the end of June. He still deliberated for another few weeks. And, and would Brian Epstein and the Beatles have not been fully assured that they had the, the recording contract until it was back with them. Yeah, absolutely. That They knew nothing until that point. They were still waiting. Um, there was a letter that went between uh, one of the senior execs at EMI and Brian towards the end of June, where Brian still said, I'm still waiting to hear, um, but we are hopeful. So it was clear that at that point, Brian and the Beatles weren't sure if they had the contract. It was all in George Martin's hands that had been a recording test or an audition and it was George Martin's decision eventually to say yeah I'm going to take a chance. I wonder why and there's probably any number of reasons why maybe you can tell us but I wonder why there was such a delay on the face of it between the two but I guess you know we you know everybody knows the Beatles today the biggest band in the world at that time they were a, a group of lads from 200 miles away in Liverpool who come down to do an audition mm -hmm. 
and probably George Martin had a lot of other things on his plate and, and probably never spent the next six weeks poring over this decision. It, it was just probably put to one side and he came back to it, I guess. Well, it was. It's, it's quite similar to when, um, when Decker had to decide if they were going to sign the Beatles or not. Because one of the big considerations was, this is a band from Liverpool. Now, don't forget, there was no motorways back then. You know, it takes hours to drive down. So that's a consideration. Plus, yeah, they were just a another band. They were auditioning all kinds of people. George Martin was desperately looking for a pop act. He needed somebody who would be a rival, particularly to Norrie Paramore, his, uh, his A&R contemporary who had Cliff Richard. So he wanted somebody. So he's prepared to take a chance. But yeah, the Beatles were just this band from Liverpool. Nobody had heard of. He wasn't too excited at that point. And do you think, do we, in fact, do we know whether Brian Epstein was still touting the Beatles round to other companies in that interim period between the audition as we know it now and the receiving the contract? Um, we do, because this was their last chance. Every other record company had turned them down. Interestingly, including EMI. EMI had previously turned them down. Um, and we're not sure exactly what it's, it's pretty sure that there were four A&R execs uh, and possibly George Martin wasn't there at the time as the other three had already turned the Beatles down uh, which prompted is it, uh, Ron White who's the EMI exec to write to Brian and basically say I'm slightly embarrassed here because I know we already turned them down but now George Martin has listened to you and he was a little bit embarrassed but he sort of got over it so that's why this one was so crucial this was their last chance if they didn't get this one that was the end of the road there were no more record companies to go to that's when John Lennon said um, he talked about uh, well we just go to the Woolworths label and that, that'll do because they had nowhere else to turn so just remind us of the key dates uh, in this story yeah. Dave the, the most important one is 6th of June 1962 so that's the date the Beatles went down they got in the studio for the first time and Again, interestingly, George Martin wasn't that involved. He'd already delegated that to Ron Richards, who was a producer, and the engineers. It was only when one of those engineers heard Love Me doing the mouth organ that they grabbed George Martin anyway. So George Martin's bit was 6th of June. They got put through the paces, make an acetate, and he'd listen to it later. So at that point, they definitely were not under contract. It was just an audition. EMI signed the contract 18th of June. And that was it. Eventually, by the, I think it's the third week in July, George Martin sends the completed contract to Brian and the Beatles at the last chance I got the contract. And that, Dave Bedford, is why you are the Beatles detective. I thank you. So, Dave, there we go. Uh, this edition of Lillipod, all focused on Sir George Martin, uh, looking at that interview that you uh, you did, uh, and also forensically analysing the situation over that uh, 6th of June audition come first recording and we've we've established that it was most clearly an audition what are we looking at next time for the next edition of Liddy pod dave um we're gonna dig into um the book i mentioned which the, the research for that one came from which is finding the fourth beetle which is the story of all the beatles drummers um there's only 23 of them so dear listener this is your chance if you don't know the answer how many beatles drummers can you count that's a great question, that Dave. And, and maybe people can post their their answers to the uh, to, to the Liddypod website. Yeah, come on to liddypod.com. Uh, we can hear the previous uh, episodes if you haven't heard them yet. Uh, drop us a line. Uh, more suggestions for MBEs. We already had a, a couple in, which is great stuff. Um, and any other comments? Yeah, let us know. It's nice to know that somebody out there is listening. Great, Dave. Can't wait for the next one. been listening to Liddy Pod, Beatles Banter with Bedford and Beasley. <laughs>